So if you didn't finish it, fill it out as we go through and give you credit for it. Partial. Partial. All right, one, what event allowed the liberation of Paris to occur? What do we got here? Kira, what do you have? Yeah, good job. The D-Day invasion. Good job, good job. And uh, Eisenhower, he wanted to try to move around Paris. Why? Why do you want to try to liberate Paris? Because uh, it was under Okay. All right. So Eisenhower at first thought, well, we're going to try to avert it because uh, divert, divert it because there's going to be a lot of action there. There's going to be a lot of defenses. It's going to cost the Allied powers a lot of resources, men. It could be casualties. Alarming number. And this might prevent the Allied powers from pushing in on Germany. We had to beat the Soviets there, right? Oh, man. They captured Berlin. Well, maybe we allow him to do it. So, with that being said, Eisenhower tries to divert. He tries to go around it at first. But what pushed him to actually liberate Paris then, to move the Allied powers through the capital of France? What was going on there? What was going on? Jeffrey? There was a Communist Party and a Democratic Party in France to decide whether Trump would be a communist or a electoral type. Okay. All right, so there's some debates amongst the what group fighting off the German authority there. Go ahead, Jeffrey. The French Freedom Force. Yeah, the French Freedom Force, right? The French Resistance, okay? And uh, they're doing a pretty good job eliminating some of the German authority there when it was you know, high-ranking officials or you know, cutting off communications or supplies, resources going to Normandy and into France. So this actually pushed Eisenhower to, uh, you know, maybe take it over, try to liberate Paris because the French resistance was so strong there. Uh, they were doing a pretty good job at uh, fighting off the German authority. So the Allied powers then try to liberate Paris. I guess they say the D-Day invasion, you know, how the French resistance did a good job cutting off supplies and you know, uh, communications to the front lines at Normandy. And then as Eisenhower's moving into France, into northern France, he wanted to try to move past it. But the French resistance was strong. And he thought this was a great idea, a great movement to try to take Paris and liberate it. So the French resistance and the D-Day invasion for number one. Two, why did General Eisenhower decide? Okay, there you go. We already talked about that one. Okay, so the French resistance changed his mind. But he thought it would be costly to try to take the capital that there would be a lot of defenses there, that there would be a lot of casualties if uh, the Allied powers try to move into Paris. All right, so three, describe what the FFI was. Why was this group so significant? What did this group do within Paris uh, once they heard the news, the Allied landings in southern France, the beaches in Normandy? Troy, what do you have for three? Uh, the French resistance group, and they created a large havoc in the French region. Yeah, good job. Good job. So obviously very happy about the invasion, how the uh, Atlantic Wall is broken by the Allied powers into northern France, broke Germany's Atlantic Wall. And uh, they thought this was the best uh, timing to try to start this huge rebellion in Paris, to try to uh, topple the German authority. And this was their best chance. Because how long did Germany acquire Paris? How long was this, uh, how long was this controlled by Germany? Troy? Yeah, about four years. Good job. About four years at this time. So right at the start of 1940, Germany had France, had Paris. All right, good. All right, four. <clears throat> what did Hitler order General Dietrich von Schleutitz to do in Paris? Uh, what did he end up doing? Finally, how long was Paris, France under control of Germany? What do we have? Forney, go ahead. Good, good job, good job. So as uh, as the Allied powers were moving into Paris, Hitler ordered them to destroy everything, 
try to destroy Paris, level it to the ground. And uh, he avoided it. He didn't listen to Hitler's orders or his plans of destroying Paris. Why do you think he didn't listen? Why do you say, nope, not going to do it? Jeffrey? You like many other German officials were tired of Hitler's words and saw that they were doing the same all right, good. Good job. Good job. Towards the end of the war, it just seemed a lot of the strategies and plans by Hitler was just a little too far, and, and uh, he didn't see the point of it, really. And uh, they were getting tired of fighting, right? This was a long, drawn-out war for Germany at this time. 1939 is when it started. 1944 is where we're at right now with this war, and, and it just seemed like no one wanted to continue to fight anymore. Hitler was acting a little psychotic here. Five. What did John McVeigh hear that made him recognize that Paris was once free again? What do we have for five? Troy, go ahead. Yeah, good job. Bells of Notre Dame. Good job. So we all know Notre Dame, the hunchback there, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, with Notre Dame, very it's really a symbol of Paris. You know, whenever you see this cathedral, uh, you, you think of Paris, France, and, and uh, it's really just one of those landmarks in the city okay been around for since the early i guess say 1100 or so maybe before that and uh, there was just a fire there last year right notre dame was burned to the ground yeah. i believe it was last year wasn't it yeah it was right around when COVID has going on right what's that what are you doing over there 2020. what 2020. 2020 okay that's what i thought all right that's what i thought, right, that's what I thought. <clears throat> and then the cross was untouched right you see that picture of Notre Dame that the cross wasn't burned down? It wasn't burned. Wow. Okay. Six. What did the previous air pilot of the Allied Power state when he was talking about the French underground movement? What do we have here for six? Kiri, what do I have for six? Uh, they played part of them when they were shot down. The guy said that it was fighting. Yeah, yeah, good job, good job. So fighting the fires there, and uh, you know, he had a hell of a time at night. Went around fighting fires and killing Germans when he got the chance. And it just showed that this movement was doing everything they could to try to push out the German authority there, and and uh, uh, really hiding amongst the public. This French freedom group, the resistance, uh, did a great job at you know, playing their strategies of toppling the authority there. And uh, moving in amongst the people, disguising themselves to try to, again, be the biggest form of resistance against a German-controlled city. All right, and then we talked about it before, whether it's communi communications, cutting off those or cutting off supplies or, you know, really just trying to set up propaganda pieces all throughout the city and uh, drive-by shooting, setting explosives up around the city to try to kill as many German troops and Officials as possible, the French resistance group is pretty strong. All right, okay, is there any questions on that? Liberation of Paris. That is good. So, again, if you didn't do it, turn it in. I'll give you some credit for it. All right, <clears throat> so bell ringer for today. Ring the bells right for me. You're ready for this, aren't right? you? are all pumped up. Of course, describe the the liberation of Paris. How does this event foreshadow the rest of the war in Europe? Okay, how do you think this will foreshadow the rest of the war in Europe? Okay, we're going to talk about an event today that really just showed what many troops and soldiers thought of Hitler's leadership. <clears throat> All right, I'll let you guys get work on it. Three going to prom? Nice, who are you going with? Uh, What's that? Oh, okay. Cool, man. Cool. I'll be there parking cars. I just got the itinerary. What are you doing? Yeah. Look out. I'm just going to be at the uh, road, I think, just waving them in. Oh, so you're not like being one of those valet things? Valet. Oh. Could you imagine that? <laughs> Oh, oh that'd, that'd be, be awesome. You said parking cars, not directing cars. Directing cars. That'd be awesome. <laughs> what are you taking, Serene? What? What are you taking? Yes, uh, oh, the South 2.0 Turbo. Okay. 
Is that a stick shift? No. The manual? She's nice. Driving it. That was all the way to her for it. Wait, so it's a manual? It's an automatic. Okay, I was going to say, I said <laughs> stick shift and he said manual. I'm like, I just want to confuse the shit. I was way out there. Just watch him trying to figure that out. With. Just confused me there. Like, what are you talking about here, Serene? <laughs> Oh, I just, yeah, you're good. Gotcha, buddy. Yeah, I'd be grinding the gears the whole way. <laughs> Stalling it. Well, considering it's automatic. I know. Yeah, but I said, is it a stick shift? He goes, manual. I'm like, well, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, well, that's a good question. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. All right, describe the liberation of Paris. What do you got here, Jeffrey? Liberation of Paris was a battle in which the United States troops, along with Canadian and other forces, took over Paris by the aid of French resistance. Good. All right, so right after the D-Day invasion, uh, the Allied powers, Great Britain, the United States, mostly, you know, obviously Canadian forces too, mm -hmm. moving into northern France, and uh, they're going to try to liberate Paris on their way to pushing Germany back to their own borders. At the same time, on the Eastern Front, Soviets are doing the same thing, pushing a German army back on the Eastern Front. And we still have troops on the ground in Italy, right? Yeah, we do. Right? So this was really, I guess you could say, a three-front war for Germany. And sooner or later, it's going to come all toppling down on them. So how does event uh, foreshadow the rest of the war in Europe? Well, it just really is the beginning of the end, I guess you'd say. Uh, since Stalingrad, the turning point of the war, Soviets were pushing Germany back. Uh, you know, the D-Day invasion, the invasion in Italy, uh, sooner or later, the German army, Axis powers, they're going to be defeated. Okay. At the same time, the United States is pushing Japan back in the Pacific, okay, pushing them back to their own borders as well. Uh, through the island hopping technique and it just seems like this war is coming to a close okay coming to a victory for the allied powers all right terms for today terms for today just one not too bad just one i'll show you a trailer for a movie i think you guys will enjoy operation valkyrie there it is operation valkyrie Got a bike yesterday. Five miles put on her already. Yeah. Is it a hockey? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, two wheels or three? Oh, tricycle. No, it was weird. Um, I got on my car, or I got on the bike, and there was a car accident on 225. The Turn car was. Fires. What's that? Turn on fire. Yeah, I got my horn on there. Yeah. Ringing a bell. Ding, ding. Help. But no, the car was up over top of the guardrail on the side of the road. It was unreal. I couldn't believe it. I don't know what happened. What's that? Uh, 225? Is that it? Yeah, 225. 
road going into Barrysburg to fill? Is that 225? I think it is. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't know if they tried to pass an Amish buggy and car coming the other way and it just swerved over, but the back end was literally on top of the guardrail on the side of the road. Pretty scary. I don't know. I saw ambulance, cop cars. I didn't see everybody was okay. I didn't see any dead bodies. No. So why are we talking about what? what is your problem? Jeez. I'll call in a pizza delight. Hey, can I get? Is there any dead bodies? No. <laughs> Hang on. All right, Operation Valkyrie. What do we have? What do we got? Jeffrey, go ahead. Valkyrie was a German World War II emergency unit. We have government operation plans issued to the Third Royal Reserve Army of the German Army. It was a case of the general breakdown in the civil order of the nation. Okay, okay. So, in case anything happened in leadership in Germany, this will let uh, the power go to the Reserve Army. And uh, this was a planned strategy. And uh, this was something that would happen, like I said, is something that would happen to Hitler, or many of the main officials in Germany, that the reserve army would gain the power. And most likely from there, uh, it would probably surrender, right? Especially in 1944. But this was already set up by the German army to, to uh, make sure that in case something ever happened to their high ranking officials, their leadership, that the power would go to the reserved army. And uh, it would give some sort of power away from, not power away from the Nazis, but in the SS. Uh, in conclusion, this was a goal established by someone to initiate this operation to put an end to the war. Okay, assassination attempt was built off of this, you know, off of this operation to try to end the war early and try to uh, really, really move past it, right? Because it's a long drawn out war for these soldiers and, and uh, the leadership at this time, Hitler was paranoid, making a lot of commands, strategies that didn't make too much sense to many of the high-ranking officials. And we already talked about it with the liberation of Paris. Uh, these generals and these uh, other officials weren't listening to his leadership anymore. And uh, this is kind of building off of that. All right, so real quick, Operation Valkyrie is really the planned assassination attempt on Hitler. Uh, build off of this operation, that power would go to the reserved army. And uh, this was created by Stauffenberg. He's a general. He uh, served in Operation Torch for the German army. And he lost, his, he lost his one eye and his arm, part of his arm. And uh, he, was, he was labeled up to a general at the time. And, uh, and uh, this was a planned assassination attempt on Hitler. So he's going to try to, again, try to push Hitler and the Nazis out of leadership at this moment with this planned assassination attempt. And it really happened, okay, at a, at a meeting out in the Wolf Slayer, okay, the Wolf Slayer in Poland. And this is out in the middle of the forest, out in the middle of the woods in a remote location. And uh, this is the German Army's plans from here on out in 1944. Okay, they wanted to try to set up their defenses on the Eastern Front, try to combat against the Western powers in Western Europe. And uh, with that being said, this planned assassination attempt was – trying to take out Hitler, trying to take out Himmler. But uh, Himmler wasn't there at this meeting. So they meet up at the Wolf Slayer real quick. I'll show you a picture of what this looks like. And uh, kind of the devastation of the bomb then. Wolf Slayer. It looks pretty cool. What a cool name. What do you think, Serene, the Wolf Slayer? Yeah, it's a pretty cool name. Uh, showing all the pictures now what it looks like. How about I just put up 1944? All right, that's kind of what it looks like a little bit. Let's see. Let's see. Just show them the destruction of the bomb. Well, anyway, this is a fortification out in Western, or sorry, Eastern Europe, right around where Poland's located. And uh, this is really just a heavily fortified bunker. Okay. And uh, this area. Again, they're where the Germans are going to meet and plan their strategies from the war from here on out. Okay, and like I said, it's out in Poland. Out in, uh, out in a remote location, out in the woods. And uh, they want to try to plan from here on out the war. 
And Stauffenberg, he thought he could use Operation Valkyrie as a way to try to end the war early. Because like I said, Germany has been fighting since 1939. And uh, this was something that the soldiers, they don't want to fight anymore. The, the uh, German officials, they're kind of getting sit, sick of Hitler's rule and his paranoia and uh, his kind of you know, out there views and beliefs. And uh, the liberation of Paris was just significant in its own. It kind of tells a story already what these high-ranking officials and soldiers thought of Hitler's command and leadership. So with that being said, Stauffenberg, okay, he was a general at the time. He was at this meeting at the Wolf Slayer as well. And he planned to assassinate Hitler and initiate Operation Valkyrie. And uh, the way he did that was he armed two explosives in a bag. And it's unfortunate, but as he was trying to arm these two explosives, a German soldier went walking by. So he only got one of the explosions, uh, the explosive uh, triggered and, and, and armed. So he puts in his, brief or his briefcase real quick, and he's walking to this meeting. And uh, because it was a hot day, they decided, well, we're not going to have our meetings in the bunker. Uh, where the bunker, there's no windows. There's obviously just one door. And if an explosion would happen inside this bunker, it would probably kill most of the people as the explosion can't escape out the windows or the door, whatever it might be. So that was unfortunate. They said, oh, that's too hot out. We're going to move into this other, you know, this other building right next to next door. And uh, there's windows in it. There's door, obviously. And the the explosion could escape out these windows. So with that being said, this 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 plan, an assassination attempt was already kind of falling apart in a way. Right? He's like, oh, geez, I only got one of the explosives armed. Now we're moving to this room where there's windows and the explosion would probably escape out the windows. But hey, we're going to still keep moving on with this. So Stauffenberg walks in the room. You have all the German officials there, some of the generals and uh, Hitler. Unfortunately, Himmler wasn't there, the second in command. If the second in command was there, that would have been even better, right? Killing as many of the many of the high-ranking Nazis all out in this explosion. But Himmler wasn't there, and, and, and Stauffenberg just continued on to try to kill Hitler, try to assassinate. So he walks into this meeting uh, with the briefcase, obviously explosions, the explosives in the briefcase, and uh, he sets it really right next to where Hitler was going to be standing. So he, he takes his position at the table, kind of moves down the table a little bit further. And one of the German soldiers said, hey, Stauffenberg, your briefcase is down here. I'll move it down to where you're at. It's like, oh, dang it, dude. What are you doing? What are you doing? So he grabs the bag, a briefcase. He brings it down to where he's at. He said, ah, oh, you know what? It should still work. Uh, we should still you know, be able to, uh, this explosion should still be able to assassinate Hitler and kill many people, generals around this area, around this this table. Uh, another unfortunate event is that there's a huge oak table that they're standing and meeting around. We all know oak is a really durable, uh, really hard, uh, you know, really dense wood. What's that? Absorbent. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So with the explosion, if that would happen, obviously the oak table would absorb a lot of the explosion. And uh, even if the explosion would happen, it would escape out the windows as well, since they had to move a meeting to a place where it was a little bit cooler for the meeting. So with that being said, he places it right behind the leg of the oak table. And Stauffenberg's like, okay, it should still work. It should still, you know, kill Hitler here. And uh, he leaves the room because he had a call, you know, back from Berlin. And as he leaves the room, he goes out to, you know, make this call. And the explosion occurs. It happens, right? And uh, from that instance, he thought everybody was killed inside that room. He thought this Operation Valkyrie was ensuing, that it was going to happen, that this assassination attempt was successful. So he bails out. He leaves. He sees the explosion happen. And on his way back, he meets up to a plane to head back to Berlin to initiate Operation Valkyrie, which he did initiate it. So many of the reserved army back in Berlin, the capital of Germany, they're like, oh, yeah, Hitler's dead. The reserved army is now in power. And uh, as there kind of a big confusion going on, because not everybody knew exactly if Hitler was dead, they couldn't believe it. They thought, again, he was like a god. So they're just like, ah, they're kind of skeptical. They're kind of moving with Operation Valkyrie uh, in, in like a slow, hesitant state. It's like, oh, I don't know if this is true or not. So the reserved army is actually gathering up a lot of the SS, gathering up a lot of the SA, the, the Nazi uh, leaders in Berlin, in Germany. 
and really trying to put them in jail, deport them in whatever ma many way. And uh, Stauffenberg thought this was the best way to try to surrender to the Allied powers. Right as he was doing this, as he was in a plane heading back to Berlin, right when he was landing, Hitler calls back to Berlin and says, I'm still alive. I'm good to go. I'm not dead. And uh, with that being said, Stauffenberg knew that was the end of his line and many of the other people that were planning this strategy to assassinate Hitler. So as he gets back, he lands in Berlin, he's gathered up, and they're trialed and killed, right? They're executed by, uh, by shooting rain, pretty much. And with that being said, this was one of the attempts on Hitler's life. Okay, there's multiple attempts on his life, but this was one of the, known, uh, one of the best known assassination attempts. And it was really close, right? It was really close. If it wasn't for the hot day, maybe if it was inside the bunker, then maybe the explosion would have killed Hitler and many of the generals around. Uh, if it wasn't for the oak table, if it wasn't for the briefcase and only one of the explosives being, uh, being timed, being triggered, and if it wasn't for one of the soldiers moving the briefcase all the way down you know, at the other end of the table behind the leg, who knows what could happen, right? But with that being said, four German officials died, but not Hitler. Not Hitler. He left with only uh, well, some impacts and lacerations along his legs. Okay, and uh, obviously some, some, some burning as well. But for the most part, he was okay. And this pushed him even more to be sporadic with his ideas, with his, his, uh, his terrible intentions. He thought it was, in a way, a God-given ability that he would never die, right? and that he would continue on with his beliefs, and that it was almost like an omen for him to continue with his his beliefs with the Holocaust, right, the concentration camps, the death camps, and moving on with this war. Uh, he thought he was an invincible after this assassination attempt. And it just goes to show that many of the German officials and people around him don't even you know, fully support his leadership anymore. So from here on out, he's going to be very paranoid. Uh, Hitler's going to really go through a lot of background checks to see who's loyal to him. And there's going to be a lot of deaths throughout the German army and high-ranking officials and uh, of uh, potential plots to maybe assassinate him, to see who's actually loyal to his leadership. But real quick, here's what the building looked like. Right, here's the room that they met in. Look at the destruction in that room there. Sorry, that's as far as I can zoom in. The destruction in, the, in that room. It's amazing how anybody really survived, and especially Hitler, where this explosion occurred. And like I said, this was one of many attempts to assassinate him, but this was probably the best known one, the well-known of these assassina assassination attempts. Again, this is kind of moving closer and closer to the end of the war. Already these German officials and soldiers are looking for his demise, looking for his, his death. And it just goes to show that the Allied powers are moving in on him as well, and that this war is coming to a close, coming to an end. All right, so that's Operation Valkyrie. I'll show you a the trailer for the movie. Oh, here's here's Stauffenberg here. Tom Cruise plays him, so he was kind of a good looking man. Right. And he had an eye patch. He lost his eye in battle in, in Operation Torch. Uh, he actually lost part of his arm as well. And uh, you'll see it in the trailer, which I show you. Tom Cruise plays him. Love Tom Cruise. Cool. Top Gun, right? Like Top Gun. Right. Pretty good movie. All right. So that's it.